My name is Sachita and I just did my education psychology doctorate at UCD. Um, and basically education psychology, just to tell you a little bit about what that is, we are interested in looking at the psychology of learning. So we're interested to see how children learn, how do they develop. Um, and so we often do different kinds of, we look at different kind of psychological theories that are behind learning. And the main area we kind of do study are learning differences or different ways that people might learn, for example, dyslexia and autism. So I grew up in Delhi. I studied, I did my bachelor's and master's there, and then I did my doctorate in UCD. Um, and I'm now working in Dublin in two different services. I'm working with the Dyslexia Association of Ireland and another private clinic. But today, I want to talk to you about dyslexia. So what I'm hoping to do is, it's going to just be around 20, 25 minutes, um, and tell you a little bit about what, what dyslexia means and some of the ways we can accommodate or what schools do for dyslexia. Um, and yes, I can't speak in Malayalam, so it's going to be in English. <laughs> um, and what I liked about that is the, the slogan that I have there, shout about dyslexia, is that this is, uh, the Dyslexia Awareness Week is in October. And in 2018, my organization talked about shouting about dyslexia. So not just talking about it, but shouting about it. So basically meaning that it's something that we should spread awareness, we should discuss openly, and it's not something to be ashamed about. It's not something to whisper about. So that's what I'm hoping to kind of do today, um, to talk a little bit more and spread a bit more awareness and understanding about dyslexia. Um, OK, so go ahead. I want to start with just a small little exercise. Uh, if you all could just take a few seconds, I'll give you like 10, 15 seconds to read that passage. So you can start now. <laughs> okay, um, stop. <laughs> I don't know if that was actually 15 seconds, but now I would like to read the second passage, uh, again around the same amount of time, and follow the instructions that are on top in the in italics. The so start. <laughs> Okay, stop. <laughs> um, so, how was that um, experience? What did you find any difference between the first two paragraphs? Did you just tell me? What? Have you words? The first, right? And the second was not so familiar, yes. <laughs> right? Um, and did you did you find any difference in how you felt when you were reading the passages? We comprehend, like, yeah, we understand what it is actually. Exactly. Great. So, exactly. So, when we, I do this, we do this little exercise with parents and teachers that we talk about with dyslexia, and everyone says a similar thing. But the first passage is quite quick and easy to understand, and then the second passage, you're finding that you're kind of going back and you're spending time to decode each word. Um, and that then affects your comprehension of the passage. What, what does it actually mean? You're not even thinking about that, you're focusing on each letter. Um, and the other thing a lot of people say is that, oh sorry, the other thing a lot of people say is that, um, I think it's just because I want to be closer to everyone. <laughs> uh, the other thing that people say is that it affects how they feel. So it actually makes them feel a bit anxious. The second passage is making them feel like, I don't know what I'm expected to do here. Is she going to ask me questions about this? Um, so this is just a little activity to kind of simulate what it would be like for a child with dyslexia in the classroom um, with, with any kind of reading passages. A lot of children with dyslexia would have to break down those words so it would be harder for them to comprehend it and imagine that in a busy classroom with lots of other things going on, with instructions being shouted at and lots of children around them and then they're also looking at persons next to them and saying that that person is already flipped ahead and I'm still stuck on the first passage. Um, so it's just, it, this is not exactly of course the experience of, of, you know, but it's just a stimulation to make you understand what it might feel like for someone. It can be very overwhelming and scary. Um, so what is actually dyslexia? Uh, does anybody have any words they want to throw out? Any, any, have you ever heard of the term before? Do you have any associations with it, with, with the word before? Like anything that you might have linked with dyslexia? might have heard of huh? <coughs> learning difficulty right absolutely anything else so uh, is the main for movie 
Huh? Oh Why yes. Go, yeah? Actually, that's a really that's a really nice one. I'm glad you brought it up because I was thinking that that was one of the first things that introduced the topic in India in a big way, uh, and it was a big change. I think people it's really helped spread awareness, and, and that kind of shows how important our general social media and movies are. Um, great. So that was yeah, that's a really good example. I, I think it was a very well done film too. It was really really powerful. Um, so. Absolutely. So I think one of the common things that people kind of understand with it often is that it's a, a difficulty. It's it's mixing letters. It's backwards. A lot of people think, oh, you, the children read B instead of D, or they see was instead of saw. Um, the truth is, it's a little bit more complicated than that. It's not just a visual thing. It's not just a visual difficulty. It's actually the, a difficulty or the difference with the way the brain processes that information. Um, and it's about how how their brain is manipulating that information, um, and and one definition of it is that it's a difficulty acquiring age appropriate reading, writing, and spelling difficulties, um, and it's a neurological thing. So there's a difference in the brain, the way the brain gives that information. Um, it's also very very common. It's one in ten, uh, around ten percent of the population. Um, which means in a classroom of around 30 people, there would be at least around three children in, in that classroom who might have dyslexia. It's also likely to run in families, so there is a genetic uh, component there. So often when people come to our clinic um, or come to the Dyslexia Association, we have, you know, they want us to assess their children and often the parent might have some form of dyslexia themselves. Um, and they haven't, maybe they haven't understood it or they found out later because of their child. So I find that quite interesting. Um, it's also likely to occur as a spectrum. So basically that means that it's different for everyone. It manifests differently. So for some people it might be quite, you know, for want of a better term, mild. So it might just impact certain aspects. For other people it can be a little bit more, it, it can make it really difficult to read at all. Um, but there are no clear cutoffs. There are no clear cutoffs to know what is mild and what is severe. And it might change depending on intervention. Um, it's also important to understand what dyslexia is not because there, there was a lot of myths around it um, and one of those things is that it's not, it's, not, it's not a disease, it's not a deficiency and it's not something to be ashamed of. Um, and again, like I said before, it's different for everyone um, and it's not related to intelligence. So that was something that was only recently found out. For a long time people thought Oh, it's all about, it, it depends on how intelligent a person is. But it's not, it's nothing to do with intelligence. Um, and it's its own, people with any, all different kinds of intelligence can still have dyslexia. Um, okay, so the main effects is related to, yeah, sorry, it's related to reading and writing. Again, it just makes it harder, not impossible. That's important to remember. Um, so if you, if you kind of think back to where it is, to try and understand dyslexia a bit better, what is the original origin of this? If we think about human nature, um, if we think back to how we were as, as ancestors, what were we doing? We were mostly hunters and gatherers, right? We were mostly working with our hands and hunting for our survival. And then we kind of moved into trades, trading. So we did a lot of craft, craftsmanship. So we were using our hands to develop things. Um, so oral language has, has existed for a long time. We've used our language orally, but reading and writing is quite a young skill if we think about it in, 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 in our history. So it's quite a new skill that the brain has learned to develop. So it kind of makes sense that for a lot of people, it's just not a natural thing. Um, and it's something that needs to be taught. We all had to learn it in school. Um, so a little bit about what causes it. So this is a, a huge field and I'm not going to get into details of it, but a lot of research has looked into the brain differences and the brain structure behind dyslexia. Um, and they have found that there are differences in the way the brain processes information. So one way that I won't go, in, again, I'm not a neuropsychologist, so I won't give you details around this, but one, one major difference that has been found is that the left hemisphere is linked a lot with language. So it's linked with literacy and language. And the right hemisphere of the brain is linked with creative tasks um, or out of the box thinking and things like music and um, 
art. And so they've, so some researchers have basically found that there is a difference in the, in the left and right hemisphere of people who can read and people who can't, as well as people who are dyslexic and people who are not. Um, and it also seems to be about effort. So it just takes much longer for people with dyslexia to learn. So the brain, the information goes through the brain, but at a, at a slower process. So it just takes longer for the same information to come up. Um, so yeah, so they've said, for example, five times a dyslexic brain has to work five times harder when reading than a non dyslexic brain. Um, these are just some examples of studies. If people are interested in, there's lots of stuff on neuros neuropsychology out there. But there are just some examples of studies that have found that people with dyslexia have less gray matter, for example, which is linked to pro pro uh, problems processing sound structure of language. And other studies found less white matter. Uh, which also affects the efficiency of brain regions. Um, so that's just some examples of it. Um, the next thing to kind of understand dyslexia a bit better is that it's linked to an understanding of phonics. So phonics basically means, this is, the, this is what research has shown most consistently, that ph phonological awareness basically means that understanding of how letter and sound connect together. Um, and it's something we start learning really early in school. So, for example, uh, what is cat without k? Can everybody tell me? <laughs> At, yes. So that is something known as segmentation. So you're taking out a sound and you, you have the word without that sound. Um, so that's one thing that we kind of learn when we're really young. Another thing is blending words. So we start to learn, okay, how do different sounds connect to make a word? For example, we start learning uh, CVC, which means consonant verbs, how do they link together? So like mat, so we learn m a t is mat. Uh, and then we also learn more complicated aspects, especially in English. <laughs> English is not an easy language, so we learn things like uh, C and H together makes a ch sound. So it's not k, it's not k, sh, it's ch. So we, we start learning, so these these underlying skills, this is phonics, an understanding of phonological awareness. And this is what has been found. A lot of children with dyslexia find this really difficult. This is not something that comes as naturally for them. It, it needs a lot of repetition and a lot of practice. Um, they will learn it, it just takes longer to learn. And it doesn't come as easily. Um, so how will that impact in the classroom? In fact, all of these different aspects of reading. So there's if you think about it, reading is actually not an easy skill. There's lots of different components involved. Um, so it can affect reading fluency. That basically means how accurately you read and how fast you read. So can you read at the same pace and can you read accurately without making mistakes? And it also includes reading well. So reading with keeping pauses and gaps and being, being aware of punctuation marks and full stops. So all of that goes into reading fluency. And then if you're reading fluently, that's when you can understand the text better. That's when you're being able to take meaning from the text. And so that's another area that's impacted for children with dyslexia. Both of these things would be much harder for them. And finally, it impacts how they write or how they spell. So again, children with dyslexia might be great at speaking orally. They might be able to explain everything orally very well. But the same information, having to write it down is much harder structuring it, figuring out how best to express it is much harder. Um, and again, with spelling, it shows up in their spellings a lot. Spelling anyway is difficult for all of us, <laughs> but for children with dyslexia, it's I, often when the kids come to, to meet us, they say that, you know, they learn the spellings and they remember it for the next day, but they've forgotten by the, by the next week. So they, the spelling rules are just difficult to retain. Um, and then, apart from the literacy aspects, there's more effects of dyslexia, and this is lesser known, but they do impact more executive functioning. Executive functioning basically means planning and organization um, and sequencing. So a lot of kids, a lot of people and adults as well might find these things quite hard. And we find often that adults, they get better at the reading aspects, but these this will still continue to impact them when they're older. Okay, um, 
So what are the behaviors that you might notice and parents might see in, in the classroom? It might look like there's a lot of effort, a lot of time being spent, but they're not being able to produce. There's not enough. The, the results don't show. Um, and then it really does affect self-esteem and frustration in the classroom. So um, dyslexia and self-esteem is actually, uh, there's a huge, it's a big area to look at because a lot of people with dyslexia have secondary aspect of where they might feel uh, less able to do things. So they might label themselves, they might think they're stupid. Um, um, but what we find, the good news there is that we find that that's not a fixed thing. It can change. And one important aspect is an understanding of that, um, of the disability and an openness and a support from society. So, so you can help that part of it. Um, Okay, so I've mostly been talking about some of the difficulties associated with dyslexia so far, but there are also strengths. So we have to kind of, we have to really remember that, that because the brain is processing information differently, it also makes it, it makes it much easier to, to get other strengths and to get uh, information through other avenues. And so some of those are things like very strong verbal skills, very, very articulate, um, a lot of creative thinking, so thinking out of the box, coming up with novel ideas and lots of entrepreneurs and inventors you know that that's a lot of them have dyslexia uh, a lot of creativity and very good leadership skills very good at delegating and i think the other thing that a lot of kids that we see is also resilience so that ability to kind of to learn to be hard working from an early age to know that things are hard but i can make an effort so that's a really really important skill to have um, and so this is just to show you that there are lots of famous people out there, people who have done, they use their dyslexia in, in, and really uh, created new things and made big contributions to society. So artists, actors, entrepreneurs, athletes, and even writers. So it just goes to show that it doesn't stop you from writing. It, you still have amazing ideas. You just need to take away that barrier of, of the written text and the reading text. Okay, so what can one do? Um, so nowadays, a lot of th there's quite a lot of awareness in schools. We find it's improving. So teachers are quite good at noticing, and they often can do street screening tests. Um, and there's lots of indicators on the Dyslexia Association website, which is by age you can kind of you know can look out for some of those indicators. And finally, there are educational psychology assessments, so people can actually go and get a diagnosis. Um, and we, interestingly, we get a lot of adults, actually, who come for diagnosis. So they've been through their entire education system and really struggled. And then they come and they want to find out. And it's just a part of their identity. They want to figure out why they've been struggling in school. Um, and how can you do those assessments? So I don't know if anyone's heard of NEPS, National Education Psychology Service. It's in Ireland, it's the service in schools. It's basically psychologists are linked to schools and they're supposed to, it's, it's a free public service. Um, unfortunately, I've heard that the waiting times are really, really bad. <laughs> so a lot of people mm -hmm. do have to go through the private route. Um, and so I know a lot of, so we, we do assessments in the Dyslexia Association. So a lot of people come there uh, and there are reduced rates available there. Um, and then there is private psychology as well that you can go to. Um, but yeah, that is one of the difficulties at the moment with the system in Ireland, I've heard. Um, so I think it was important to kind of bring up this as well, because on one hand, I think it's important to, of course, give the skills and for a child or a person to develop skills. But at the same time, we want to improve the accommodations. We want to change society. We want society to, to be more aware and we want our education systems to change. Um, so now there are, it's, it's really great, there are lots of supports throughout from really from like junior infants to college and after. There are lots of supports for people with dyslexia, um, at least in Ireland. I don't, I don't think as many in India yet. Um, so some of these are uh, learning support. So a teacher it will provide a child with extra support. So they might leave the classroom and go and study extra. They might get tuition, basically. Um, then there is a special school known as a reading school. So that actually children can leave and go and study in the school for three years. And they get um, 
you know, they, they get very, they get better teachers who know about dyslexia, teaching them. Um, and then they go back to the school. So it's just for a little bit, a short time. There's exemption from Irish. <laughs> so this one is an interesting one because we get a lot of people, uh, I don't know if anyone here has children in school, but uh, a lot of schools have Irish, which is compulsory for kids. And it's often a very difficult language. That's what, again, I hear that it's, it's, it's much harder and it's uh, along with English to study. And so this is something that causes a lot of stress to children with dyslexia often because they're trying to learn two languages. Um, and so a certain, now there's a criteria yeah, there's a criteria that if kids get a certain percentage below, they can actually not have to do Irish. Um, so, and, um, oh yeah, and then there's also accommodations in, in state exams. So there's junior leaving cert, there are accommodations, so they have special, they have extra support, like um, you can get a spelling and grammar waiver, so you don't have to worry about spellings. I would have loved to have that in school. <laughs> um, Okay, uh, I'll skip past these. Yeah. Um, then just some of the common interventions that that we often suggest to families and to parents and to schools is things like a phonics. So I was telling you about phonics, phonological awareness being really important. So it makes sense that a phonics program would be quite important. So there are structured programs like this, toe by toe, which works at those basic skills in a very structured way. Um, then there's reading strategies, spelling strategies, and assistive technology. Um, this is an interesting one. I, I wanted to just share this one because I find it quite nice and it can work for any child. So if you have children at home, it's something to try out with them when you're teaching them to read. Uh, it's just about reading words out loud together and you're really supporting the child to read and you're not letting them struggle for very long so you're providing them with the word if they find it difficult um, and you make sure that the child repeats it and then you also make it fun so again that's really important so you're kind of giving them asking them to retell the story in their own words or you're giving putting on different voices and you might ask them to summarize and might ask the child to tell the story back so it's about again creative thinking and coming, you know, finding different ways to engage them with reading. Um, so yeah, these are all available again online. You know, tips if, if people want them later. Um, assistive technology. I've just put a few examples, but this is a huge field. Like there is so much out there now to support a dyslexic reader, and it, it's actually for anybody. I, I find them really helpful. I listen to podcasts now all the time because assistive technology has really made learning more accessible. Um, I think we are using that tool today to put this on YouTube for people who, are, who can see it later on. Um, so some examples now for, for reading is through things like ebooks and audiobooks. So there's, these, this just makes it much more accessible. So you're listening to the book as well as reading. Or you can highlight it, you can do all kinds of things with it. You can have highlight certain words and have, you know, a, a just get a definition or meaning out of that. Um, and they work on tablets and there are lots of apps as well. Um, okay, um, just the last few things I want to kind of, I thought these would be interesting for people because these are just not for the dyslexic learner but for any anybody who's learning is things like Multisensory, distributed practice, metacognition, and growth mindset. So, multisensory basically means that we're learning with all our senses. So, research has kind of shown that there is no such thing as a learning style. There are learning preferences, but that all of us kind of learn better if we use all our senses to learn something. So, if you're listening to it, if you're doing something with it, if you're seeing it, it's much more likely to go into long-term memory. Um, so that's a tip for anyone who's studying still, like try to engage with the material using all your senses. Write it out, speak it out, and repeat as much as possible. And that's what distributed practice is. So like you're doing the same thing but over every day in continuous cycles and little bits. Um, the other thing that's really good for learning, which research has shown, is metacognition. So that basically means thinking about your thinking. So thinking about how you learn. Uh, so kind of, so for example, if, you know, if you're preparing for an exam, actually think about what strategies am I using here? 
am I using anything different? When am I studying? Am I studying during the day? Am I studying at night? Which one is better? Um, so kind of stepping back and seeing what works and what doesn't and changing it if it's not working. So it's, it's kind of, you know, a, a wider gaze at how you learn and that, that is supposed to be really, really helpful. Um, and that's also active learning. So you're actively engaging with it. It's not a passive memorization. You're actively engaging with it. This is a, a really nice concept actually and something I would recommend a lot of people if, you, if you're interested in this stuff to go and check out online. There's like TED Talks and YouTubes. Carol Dweck is a researcher. She studies, um, she was really interested in studying motivation uh, of learning. What What is the underlying, that really important thing about motivation when we, when we want to learn. And she kind of thought of this two ideas, which is a fixed mindset and growth mindset. So a fixed mindset towards learning is this idea that intelligence is fixed. You know, I've, I have, I'm good at this and I'm not good at that. And that's all I can't, I can't progress. Um, and often, unfortunately, I think our children do pick up on those, on, on those, um, that kind of narrative and that self-talk and they believe that they can't. Whereas growth mindset is just attitude that the brain is constantly changing. Um, and that we are very capable of learning and, and, the, and intelligence is not a fixed thing. It's, it, will, it can improve if you, if you keep learning. So I really like that positive kind of thought about it. And, um, and yeah, so check that out if you are interested in that. Um, and yeah, a part of that is kind of making praise contingent on effort. So it's not just about output, but it's about how much effort are you putting in something and praising that effort as well because that's really key to learning um, and also reframing negative statements so helping our children think of that you know if children say that's always happening to me or I never get it right so kind of helping reframe that that that's not really true um, and to kind of give that positive talk of I'm gonna try again or I'm gonna try the effort is important okay um, so just some books that are, I think are really great if people are more interested. These are, again, to help children understand dyslexia. So this has actually been written by students themselves. Um, and it's just, yeah, it's just a fun way to understand dyslexia for young people. And these are some stories no. on, that, that um, have dyslexic characters in them. So again, I think you were saying Tari is a main poem. So I think popular media and books are really a good way to kind of understand uh, that and make it more fun. And these are some talks that um, I'm sure if we can share these slides, you guys can check these out. I find some of these really interesting uh, because they, they show dyslexia in a different way. They talk about the strengths of dyslexia. The last one is actually really cute. It's, it's, a, it's an animation uh, and uh, it's a really fun way of, it's been described in a very accessible way by, by children. So that's a nice one. Uh, and I'm just going to end with this idea of neurodiversity. So this is a relatively new term that's kind of coming up, even in my field in psychology, that we're starting to understand that all of these different learning styles like and different terms that we're giving, these diagnoses that we give, dyslexia, dyspraxia, autism spectrum, all of these are actually, it's a concept that they're just a human variation. So there's just a different way that people learn, just like any other variation like hair color or eye color. And it's not a disease and it's not something that needs to be cured. So I think that's, that's a really, really important one to kind of get our ha uh, heads around for, for schools and for our societies to kind of realize that these differences are to be celebrated and they're really important for society to, to move ahead and progress. So yeah, I like that, that, that concept of it. Um, and this is just about the Stexia Association. We, uh, if anyone ever needs um, more information, and if you know someone who might be dyslexic, who might want support, we can co contact our office. We're based in Talbot Street, and we run an information service. We run uh, dyslexia workshops. We run teacher training and parent courses, and we also run workshops for children. So that's our contact details right there. And that's it. I'm done. <laughs> Thank you.